Down the hallway, Studio A, with our own Sarah Bradshaw, Sarah Watkins, live on the bridge. And welcome to another 909 session here on the bridge. I'm Sarah Bradshaw standing in for John Hart as we welcome Sarah Watkins into the studio. She's on tour for her third solo album, Younger and Young in All the Wrong Ways, on New West. And our listeners are probably going to be familiar with Move Me and Say So, um, of course, among other things for Sarah Watkins fans. Playing tonight out at Knuckleheads River Wireless, going to be opening the show. Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time. So happy to be here. And so... You know, you've been involved in a ton of collaborations. And uh, for those who may not be familiar, of course, Nickel Creek, when you were eight years old with your brother, Sean Watkins, and Chris Thiele, uh, the Watkins Family Hour. Um, I am with her, which for Bridge fans also includes Aoife O'Donovan and Sarah Jaros, who we love here. Mm -hmm. uh, Percussion for the December is Prairie Home Companion. You're just always Percussion working. For December. <laughs> well, I got to hit one kind of song, <laughs> one drum on one song. <laughs> Uh, I did other duties more often, but but I'll take it. That's your that's your liner. It's percussion for the yeah. Decemberists. I'm in everything, <laughs> but you're you're always working. You're I working. like to work. I like yeah. to work, and I, I love collaborations. I think um, I really enjoy getting to to dig into the role that I play in in one situation, be it my own tour or supporting somebody else, and then getting to uh, switch roles in 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 the next project. It's really um, you learn from from each thing and, and each each project helps helps the next in a in a really incredible way. Well, and we could almost say your first collaboration, at least the first one I could find, was um, with the very thing that inspired you. Really, started your career, bluegrass, etc. Every Saturday night when you were a kid. Yeah, well, that that was this band that, that played, like you said, every Saturday night. They uh, they had this residency at a pizza parlor and. As a kid, we were we were really as kids we were really lucky because they not only were incredible musicians but they were really welcoming to us and and to everyone they were they were sort of a, a cornerstone in the in the, the music scene in San Diego for for many years and they were also really generous teachers and uh, and it was it was an incredibly um, fortunate way to like primary experience with music it was incredible. Well, so your family would go to this this place every Saturday night for seven, eight years. Is that yeah, right? Like from the time I was two till I was probably seven or eight. This was it was just our Saturday night activity, and um, and a lot of you know there's there's a wonderful community of people who go to see that kind of music. It's it's small, but it's tight knit, and it, and it it felt very um, familiar. And um, and then we'd go to bluegrass festivals in the surrounding area during the summer, and and you'd meet other kids who are into playing fiddle tunes and many of those people I'm I'm a, I'm still really good friends with after all these years including uh, Gabe Witcher who produced the new record he uh, he's a, he's a kid who um, well he he and I were kids were kids together uh, it, competing at, at fiddle contests and um, and all these years later we're still still working together it's it's pretty cool and also of punch brothers fame right yeah he's a fiddle player and percussionist in in there punch brothers go. is he is he really the percussionist the, he, they're the drums <laughs> on stage yeah, and no, he I plays know. the thing uh he does a really good job and um and yeah he's he's a he's a he's a great great uh musician well i mean and so in addition to that so your first ever singing experience was with bluegrass, etc. When you were four years old, yeah. For Long Black Veil, is that yeah, right? It was like they were. It just seemed really normal to to um, what they did is they would invite friends up on stage to sing. You know, you know, to pick one of their five songs that they would sing every every week, and so you know, Don would come up and and play bass and sing. You know, pick a song to sing, and then you know. Uh, Rich Beasley would would come up and dance, like do um, buck dancing, which is like clogging on a tune or two, and it was just this, you know, this great little exchange that would happen between the the band and the audience. And and um, when I was four, we we'd become friends with the band. My family had become friends with with John Moore and and the rest of the band. And uh, I asked for them to sing Long Black Veil, which is this terribly tragic murder ballad. Yeah. And um, and John said, "We'll do it, but you have to sing it." And, uh, and I only knew the chorus, so I went up and, and I was I was very little. He's very tall, and he played mandolin, and so his little his mandolin mic he just like bent it down for me, and uh, it was really fun. They 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 were um, I, because of that. I feel like uh, music is something that you know that it's it's not something that that's just for you know famous people to do or something. It really instilled this this appreciation that oh everybody should. Sing. Everyone should play. It's just normal, and 
um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Well, and so what a, an awesome childhood, too, because so every Saturday night you were going to this awesome bluegrass thing. So you were experiencing music all that way. But then on Sundays, I guess after those late nights or however long it would be, you'd work Oh, I would the, fall asleep at, 10 p, at 8 right? p.m. Oh, okay. On a, on a pizza parlor bench. <laughs> That's awesome. Right in front of the monitor. 8 p.m. sharp. <laughs> so uh, having enough animal. energy to work the acreage the next day with the... Work the acreage. What was it? That's what, with the orchards. All I know is that I saw something that said you'd have to carry water to the Are ice you? plant. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, well, that was many years later, but Sundays, <laughs> Sundays in my family were family days. That was, okay. it was, it was, uh, there were, it was just understood. There was not really going to be a lot of friend hanging out on Sundays. Right. If you did a slumber party, you're home early and it was family day and we would do a lot of yard work. That would be, you know, that would just be taking, taking care of everything around the house. Um, but yes, you are right. I did carry, <laughs> my dad built the house that, that we ended up moving into and, uh, there was a period of time when there were not really water. There was not water down to the bottom, so there were a lot of buckets being carried. Um, and yeah, yeah but that, that's a different story. Can you explain to people what an ice plant is for us Missourians? What, what an ice plant is? Yes. Do you know what an ice plant I have, is? I do now. <laughs> like, I will admit that I did not before. Ice plant is uh, is ground cover that is... Not very smart for California to use anymore because it takes a lot of water. It's, it's basically, um, it's like a, it's similar to a succulent. It might be actually be a succulent. A lot of one of very common kind is um, red apple, just mostly green, and the flowers are these these little red, uh, brilliant red flowers. Or uh, there's pickleweed, which is another kind of ice plant, which grows on the coastline. That was also not a good idea because it <laughs> erodes the coastline. It's far <laughs> too heavy. The roots are, roots are House too is shallow. falling into the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Any part of that? Yeah. Uh, so. You did say at one point that this kind of instilled that idea of you, and I think it I think it's reflective in your songwriting that you, you get out what you put in, that having to do things every Sunday. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? I, yeah, I definitely think that. I, my parents were really good at, at, um, at emphasizing the... Um, I, think, I think American culture in general, it's hard to grow up without hearing the, the phrase, you know, you, you'll find what you're good at. You'll, you're good, everyone's good at something, you'll find what you're good at. So I kind of imagined that... One day I would just try something and be good at it, and then that would just answer that question, and I could do it for the rest of my life. And music was never, it didn't seem easy to me at all. I practiced a lot growing up, and, um, and my parents, both are teachers, and they were really good at, at you know, creating this, this regular practice uh, of, you know, of studying, doing school, or, or working outside, or, or, you know, playing music and, um, and commitment to your... Uh, to you know what, what you've said you'll do to, to, to be prepared for it and um, I'm really lucky I, I feel like that that's a that's something that I that I still draw on well that being said we'd love to hear some of your craft great well thank you um, I'll do the I'll do the title track of this album this was the first song that I that I wrote for the uh, for the record young and old Young in all the wrong ways The take is pretty clear to see Honey, it's all the same Cracks in the windows Broken chairs, no one to blame There was a time for me to hold on There was a time for trust But I'm not Feel that burn 
my future It's all the past You get another And it might last You remind me of the girl I was When I was young and Thank you. That was gorgeous. Thank you. For people who are just now tuning in, we're joined today for a 909 session with Sarah Watkins, who's going to be taking the stage tonight out at Knuckleheads, River Wireless, opening the show. She's on tour in support of her brand new album, Young in All the Wrong Ways, which is the song that we just heard, the title track from the album. You know, it's, I think, a lot of times that it's hard for musicians because... You know, there are a couple of different ways that people approach songwriting. They either dig into themselves and find things from experiences, or maybe they're storytellers and they're just really good at making things up. Some people are kind of a combination of both. And so this album, it, it has a, a couple of songs that I, a lot of people have been um, guessing about the origin. And at least for a couple of the songs on this album, I think, it, I mean, they are, it's definitely, a, they're breakup tracks, but they're breakup tracks you, with yourself. So you've said. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the songs are not autobiographical right. in terms of, you know, they're, they, they, they're not a walkthrough of events that happened in my romantic life. Um, they, I think most songs are, you know, you, you have many points and, and that you're drawing from and, and you put it together in, in one little three to four minute piece and I think, you know, if, if music is art, that's what makes it art. And I think that um, for me, what I, was, what I was really working with going into, you know, what, what became this album was um, feeling like I, I felt like just very comfortable. And I, I got a little scared by that. I felt like um, I don't. I don't want to be comfortable. It the the world is too complicated for that. And I'm nor am I trying to like stir up, you know, trauma or or drama in my life. I just I felt like I wasn't engaged enough. I felt like that meant that I just I, there were some things that I probably should be digging into, and um, and so I just kind of I know I didn't want to find myself in some rut accidentally. You know, five years down the road, be the same person that I was you know, and think the same way that I did five years ago. I think that's, uh, the world moves too quickly for, for that, for me. And um, instead I wanted to sort of, you know, check back in and, and, and adjust some things. You know, I heard phrases come out of my mouth that I would say five or 10 years ago and realize, oh, I don't think that anymore. That's not me. And, you know, sometimes those little adjustments can be easy um, little course corrections and sometimes they can be a little bit more disruptive and for me I started it started to be fairly disruptive um, and but I didn't want it to make me anxious I wanted to to feel it as sort of like this positive disruption of 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 eventual forward motion um, the kind of turbulence that you see behind a ship when, when it's, you know, when you hear the engines running and, and you're at the back of the ship and it's calm water and then all of a sudden you see this churning underneath and it'll be churning for a good couple of minutes before there's any kind of forward motion and that's kind of what I wanted. That was sort of this, the visual that I had accompanying the feelings. And, um, and so I, I, started, I started digging in and, um, 
and uh, and then I had a lot to say, I guess, because it it ended up being a full album's worth. Well, I mean, and that's another thing. You've, I mean, you've been a musician, pretty much career musician since you were eight years old, but you really actually didn't start writing your own songs until you were in your 20s. Exactly, yeah. I, I was a little intimidated to, to write. I, I mean, I wrote lyrics, but I never put them to, to full melodies or, or ever performed them in front of anyone. Um, I, was, I was around people who I felt were really good songwriters uh, at young ages, and I didn't want... It was a little intimidating. intimidating. I, I felt yeah. like um, whatever, I, whatever I wrote, whatever my first song was, it had to be profound. It had to, like, I was a very serious <laughs> kid. It had to be, you know, deep and, and, and previously unsaid by anyone else. And I think that um, that, that just, just had me stumped for a very, very long time. Um, but I had a friend, Glenn Phillips. We were recently uh, in uh, Ames, Iowa, at the M Shop, which is which is a place that, that we played years ago with our friend Glenn Phillips, uh, Nickel Creek and Glenn Phillips, and um, and it was on that trip that he, you know, he he sort of challenged us to do this songwriting game where we just pick a title, and of a, of a, of a pick a, pick a, a phrase or a name, and then all of us had to write a song by that title within 24 hours, and we did this for a full week, and it was it was life changing for me because it all of a sudden it didn't have to be profound; it could just be this thing it just had to you know you just had to write a song and um and that was that was very 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 helpful and um and uh so then I then I started writing a lot more but my first two records were were only half originals and half covers I love singing other people's songs but um you mentioned the family hour earlier the Watkins family hour is a collaboration with my brother and that and, and many many other people and and part of the the essence of that show is is finding this great uh, common catalog with everyone on stage and any guests who come and you play a lot of cover songs. And we did a tour last summer of that. And, and I think particularly uh, because of that, it felt it felt really good to, I felt like I'd sort of like, I had I'd gotten a lot of covers out of my system and it was uh, particularly satisfying to to be able to to make a record of my own solo material. Well, and you had even said at one point that you were, you were surprised at how good it felt when you looked down and you realized that most of the set lists were all your own. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's new. That's it's, it's new for me. Um, I, I, as I said, I love singing other people's songs, but it, it's it's cool now just to see this. Um, you know, just to see that the songs on my set list are from you know many projects and many um, many years, and and uh, um, they're like little little souvenirs. Do you want to know what one of my favorite quotes from you was about songwriting? Please. <laughs> it was on I E-Town. bet I stole it from someone. <laughs> no, it was on E-Town. And it was um, basically my approach to songwriting is I just, I vomit the lyrics up on a page and then I sort through the peas and carrots. Yeah. <laughs> like, which I actually think is quite wonderful. And I think it uh, expresses songwriting in a pretty awesome way. Are you a songwriter yourself, Sarah? Mm. No? Never? No. I am very, I admire songwriters. I yeah. admire songwriters. So you know, another thing that people are commenting on, and, and it's funny, I, I honestly didn't pick up on right away because I do, I love the new album. I honestly love the new albums. The the characteristic fiddle, it's just not there very much in this album. Why is that? It's just, you know, I think fiddle is, is like you said, it's characteristic. It's a very strong uh, impression. And I think it's, well, two things. Gabe Witcher, who produced the record, and I are both fiddle players. So it's if fiddle players are making a record, it's either going to be all fiddle or no fiddle. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I think it was important to, to to me that the fiddle just not have as much of a presence. We kind of wanted this record to be a little bit more lyrically driven, and um, and to make sure that the the mood of the performances was. Um, was fitting to the mood of, of the lyrics. And um, it just didn't seem to be necessary. Right. It's a beautiful album, and I think it's uh, it's definitely benefited from it. And speaking of the album, I mean, really, there, in addition to all of the, the beautiful things that you have done with this album and all of the things that you have expressed, there's an all-star cast yeah. on this album. It's pretty great. Yeah, Sarah DeRose, Ifo Donovan, pretty much all of, almost all the Punch Brothers, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Chris Eldridge plays guitar, and Paul Coart, yep. and um, even Pickles plays a little banjo on there. Nice. Um, 
and uh, and a lot of a lot of LA friends uh, joined in and just sort of camped out at the studio with me. And um, in about twelve days, we we tracked it, and it was it was it was really fun to uh, to get to sing with with that band. Right. So you've got this song on the album as well, like New Year's Day. And I mean, we're getting close, but I was just curious because in the research you said you used to have this uh, ritual that you used to do on New Year's. Do you still do that? I haven't done that in, in a little while. It was, it was an accidental ritual um, at first. I, uh, I woke up really, really early at a, at a party. I spent, spent the night at a party in San Diego proper. I'm from San Diego County, a little bit further north. And so I, you know, I got up surprisingly early, probably around like five or something. And, um, and I felt great. And so I just wanted to hit the road. And I don't, I, I don't know if those words have been said very often on about New Year's Day. <laughs> I, know. I woke up well, at 5am and I felt surprisingly great. <laughs> like, <laughs> I could have maybe slept in a little bit longer and felt not so great, but right. I just kind of beat the system a little bit, I think. And, um, and I, I hit the road and just kept driving and I ended up in the desert and, um, just listening to, to records all the way and, 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 you know, driving some of my favorite roads out, out in the mountains and beyond. And, um, it's, the desert's a really, really uh, important place for me. And, um, I've driven through it and camped in it and, um, spent a lot of time out there. And, uh, you know, there's something really powerful about, you know, being um, in such an incredible expanse. It, it's, it's our prairie, basically, you know, um, just this beautiful flat wash landscape and, and, and to just be one of the, one of the tallest things out there um, with, with huge sky. It's, it's pretty, um, it's really moving, I think. And it's similar to, to the feeling that I get when I'm, when I'm swimming in the ocean, you know, there's this, um, incredible um, empowerment in, in being so vulnerable, I think, in those places. Congratulations on being the first woman to win Instrumentalist of the Year at the <laughs> Americana Honors and Awards. I Thank mean, <laughs> what is that? it's quite, I mean, it's quite a feat. So it's very nice. Seriously, very congratulations. Nice. Yeah. Should it have happened before? What's the... <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I mean, like, I could, I could name, like, 70 other musicians that should have gotten it. But, I mean, it's a very nice little pat on the back. Oh, rock um, on. And so it was very sweet, yes. Well, okay, so you are constantly working. You're constantly pushing yourself. Do you see anything in the future that you've got your, your eyes set on or your heart set on? Not like just putting out an album was enough, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's always another There's always another project coming ahead. But I'm, I'm pretty... Um, and there will be there will be many other projects um, that that I'm excited about. But but for now, it's been really fun to to dig into these songs um, because, as you said, this this record is still pretty new out there. And um, I've been out touring with um, my friends um, David Garza and Michael Libermento, yes. both incredible musicians. And and they'll be with you tonight. At they're with me tonight. Yeah. yeah. And um, and it's been you know we're still digging into these songs and figuring out really cool ways everyone's playing two or three instruments on stage sometimes at the same time and um so there are a lot of different ways into the songs given that those constraints and um options and uh it's it's just a really fun exploration every night it makes all the shows different and special and um and you know unique to the room and the audience and the uh, the day sarah it's been an absolute pleasure thank having you having you in the studio could we get one more song from you yeah I'll do Move Me here. <clears throat> Thank you for the support, by the way. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the, uh, the wonderful interview, Sarah. Every step's been shown to you Like all those years of school What they said is what you say What they saw is what you see You like a clear drawn line Partition and divide So you can rest in knowing Everything's as it should be But I want you to move me I want you to move me I want you to move me 
talking quickly doesn't leave much time for questioning. So much is repetition. We mimic old decisions and walk the same path just because we know where it will lead. But I want you to move me. And that is a beautiful live rendition of Move Me from Sarah Watkins live in our 909 studios. You can catch her tonight out at Knuckleheads. And uh, River Wireless going to be opening young in all the wrong ways. You could uh, hear that beautiful stepping outside. You've talked about stepping outside of your comfort zone with your vocals and the way that you've really just pushed the boundaries to beautiful effect. So thanks for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I, vocally, I'm, I, it's it's. Been, I feel more comfortable actually than I ever have. That's I feel awesome. like uh, it's been it's been really fun too, especially like playing with different bands. That's that's one thing you, you find that you kind of you can come out in different ways. I don't know I kind of sense the liberation, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. So I'm a liberated woman, Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Watkins. Thank you so much again, Sarah Watkins, tonight at Knuckleheads. Have a great night. <laughs>